Well, as you know from uh, Bulletin and other sources, we are study, starting a uh, study tonight uh, on the providence of God. And uh, I didn't know until about a week ago that this is what I would be teaching. And then I really didn't know until about today what I would be saying about uh, the providence of God. But when you, when you think about the providence of God and you think about coming to a class and uh, that we're going to dedicate a whole quarter uh, to talking about this subject, uh, what does that mean to you? What do you think of when you think of the providence of God? I hope... God's kind of working in the background to make things happen. Okay. God's working, uh, Jerry says, God's working in the background to make things happen. Is that, is that right? Is that, is, that, is that what providence means to you? That God, God works, He kind of works behind the scenes to make things happen in our, in our lives. What do you think of? Providence of God. What does that mean to you? You think of that subject. Anybody got anything? Fran? We don't know the plans that he has. Does he have plans for us? Does he have uses for us? Do we always know what those are? Do we always know how he will use us? Don? For me, it's God working things out in the natural, not miraculously. Uh, but it's God working things out in the And that, this, is, this is something we're going to talk about. Hopefully we'll get to it tonight in some of these introductory comments. But th this is a distinction that we need to be able to make when we think about the providence of God. And that is, as, as, as Don has stated, this is, the, the providence of God is something that happens naturally as opposed to it happening supernaturally. There's a difference between the providence of God and miracles of God. There's a difference between God using natural means to bring about certain events and certain ends and God using supernatural or miraculous means to bring about those. And we've got, we've got to see that distinction uh, in how things fall out and how things take place today. Let, let's, let's begin by thinking about, uh, first of all, think about God as, as the creator of this universe. And, and, and the difference we, and, and the, where I'm going with this is do we believe that God created all things? you believe that? Give, give me a verse that says God created all things. In the beginning, God created what? Heavens and the earth. Okay, so you start in Genesis 1.1. Give me a verse that, that tells us. Give me another verse. John 1.1. Starts the same way, right? In the beginning was the Word. Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the, begin in the beginning with, with God. Verse 3 says what? How many things were made by Him? All things were made by Him. Was there anything that was made that He didn't make? So here's Jesus, and uh, when it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that's not just God the Father. Uh, that includes God the Son in John 1 and verse 3. Give me another verse. Colossians chapter 1. Look in Colossians chapter 1. Similar to John chapter 1 uh, in verse 3 because it's also talking about Jesus. But what, what do we learn in, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16? Uh, you, you again see this, this little word A-L-L. How, how many things were made by Him? All things. For by Him, Colossians 1, 16. For by Him, Christ, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Here's this word again. All things were created through him and for him. We're going to come back to verse 17 in a minute. But he made all things. Everything that is around us, God made it. Look in Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, um, Paul's in the city of Lystra. And uh, while he is there in Lystra... Uh, the people there get this brilliant idea that they are going, uh, Acts chapter 14 and verse 13, uh, they get the brilliant idea that they are going to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas because they have deemed them to be gods. 
Okay. How would you feel if somebody was about ready to offer a sacrifice to you uh, and because they deem you to be a god? Would you feel pretty important? Would you feel pretty good about yourself? Uh, <laughs> you better put the brakes on. Yeah, that's what Paul says. Verse 14, Acts 14, 14. When the, when the apostles uh, Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying, and say, cry, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God. We're gonna, we'll, we'll talk about, but, but in case I forget to talk about that, notice that he says, he could say you turn from these things to God, and that would have been just as true. What is he wanting them to turn from? When he says these things, what is he wanting them to turn from? Idolatry. Idolatry. The false gods that are there and these idols. Um, are those gods living? No. They're stone dead. So here he says, you don't need to worship me. because wh Why? I I'm a man. I'm just like you. I mean, why, why are you going to worship me? I I'm no different than you are. We're, we're both men. And the only difference is that I'm here preaching to you to tell you, turn away from these things that you're worshiping and turn to the living God. Now, what does that, when you think about the providence of God, what does that tell you about the nature of God even today? He's still alive. He says, I want you to turn to the living God, the end of verse 15 says, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. And we could go on and on and on talking about various passages and using various passages to say, here's the Bible saying that God has created all things. And here's just a few more verses. You, you know, uh, uh, fool has said in his heart, uh, Psalm 14, that there is no God. You all know that verse, Psalm 14? Psalm 19 and verse 1, the heavens do what? Declare the glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork. Romans chapter 1, I don't, do I have that one up there? Romans chapter 1, left that one off. Romans 1 verses 19 and 20. If, how, when God made things, how can we know that the invisible exists? Romans 1 verse 20 says, I can know the invisible exists by the things that are made. And God says, I can see things that are made, I can see the creation and having seen the creation, I can know that God exists, and I can know it so much that I'm without excuse if I believe otherwise. That's what Romans chapter 1 uh, and verse 20 says. We know that God created all things. And, and if, if, we, if we say that He didn't, if we get the idea that, uh, that God did not create all things, God says you're a fool. That's what Psalm 14 and verse 1 says. You're a fool. It, it, you have... You have to be taught evolution. You, you, can't, you can't figure that one out on your own. Evolution is a taught theory. Is it possible that man could determine some kind of creation on his own, or does that have to be taught too? What does Romans 1 and verse 20 say? I see these things. I'm without... Ex I can know, Romans 1 verse 20 says, I can know the eternal power of God and I can know the Godhead just by seeing the things that are around me. What does that mean? That means that without ever picking up a Bible, I can know that there is an intelligent designer. And while that's not being taught today and while that's trying to be ripped from every part of our society today, there is intelligent design which demands that there be an intelligent designer. But the question we want to talk about in this class is not, did God create all things? But the foundation is that He did create all things. The question is, is He doing anything today? I mean, if, if He created all things, that's thousands of years ago. And let's say that He created all things, but is He doing anything now? Does the Lord work in the affairs of men today? Not, did, did He work in the... If you believe the Bible, and if you read the Bible, does the Bible talk about God working in the affairs of men in Bible times? Sure it does. Is He still doing it? 
Well, if yes, how, how is he doing that? How do we know that he's... And, and that's, that's part of, a large part of the discussion about providence of God. We know that God has made all things, but now what? What's he doing now? Emily, did you have your hand up or somebody? Go ahead. That, that's, one of the, that's, one of the great, uh, that's one of the great proofs about the providence of God, and, and, and we'll see it in, in some of the things we'll talk about. And, and Emily's talking about, you know, God tells us to pray. Why? If, if God's not working today, what's the purpose of prayer? Is it just to make us feel good? You know, is it just to soothe ourselves? Or is there any power in, 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 in our prayer? Ask and it shall be given you. What, what does the word providence mean? If, if you pick up your Bibles, uh, you're going to find the word providence one time uh, in, in, in the New Testament, and it's not even used about God. It's used about man. Uh, if you look up, uh, and you may find the word provision, uh, and again, it's used about man uh, and not used about God. But we use the word providence today, and we don't really use it to talk about um, man we use it to think about the providence of God. And usually when we think about providence, we think about, uh, if you drop that NCE on there, what do we usually think about when we think about the word providence? What is it? It's God providing. providing. That's our definition. And so you pick up an English dictionary, and that's the English word is this idea of provision. That, that God, is, God is providing those things that we need. And He's doing that. But the word providence is more than just God giving something. And it's more than just God doing something. If you go back and look at the, the Latin word and the Greek word from which we get the word providence, you get this understanding that there's a foresight or a forethought that's involved. It's not just God, it's not just God providing something for me and giving it to me. It's God knowing and knowing when. Foreknowing, forethinking, that I need that, and making a way for me to have that. One of the passages we'll study this quarter is in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus uh, says, beginning in verse 25, don't worry about the things of this life, what you shall eat, what you shall uh, put on, what you shall drink. Don't worry about these things. Why should I not worry about these things? I mean, don't, I want to eat, don't you? I want to have something to drink. Don't, I want to have something to wear, don't you? Why shouldn't I worry about these necessities of life? What answer does Jesus give? Say again. He's going to provide for you. How do I know that? <laughs> he says so. Isn't that simple? But yet, what do we do? Well, I'm not sure. You know, I'm, not, you know, I'm, I'm kind of worried. Am I, is he really going to do that? Our Father knows what we need when? Before we ask it, before we even know what we need, He knows what we need. That's forethought. That's forethinking. That's looking down the road and saying, David is going to need this down here, and the providence of God is working, as we've talked about, behind the scenes so that when David gets over there, David has what he needs. Am I going to need food and drink and clothing uh, if I'm still alive 20 years from now? Am I still going to need it? Where is it going to come from? God's working so that 20 years from now I have those things. that God is working so that 20 years from now, if you're still alive, you'll, or two years from now or 20 days from now, you'll have those things that you need. And, and that's, that, if you're faithful, that's the promise of God. That's what verse 33 says, is to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things will be, will be added to you. Look in, uh, we won't look at all these, but look in 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is not talking about God. Uh, again, the New Testament does not use this word that we use, this uh, word providence, does not use it to talk about God, but it does use it to talk about man. Uh, look, and I want us to see just this one verse in 1 Timothy 5. You know this verse in verse 8 where it says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith 
and is worse than an infidel. What's that talking about? Anybody have a clue what that's talking about? Providing for your family. Is it the responsibility, um, specifically as we think about it at this point, is it the responsibility of the man of the home to provide for his family? What if he doesn't provide for his family according to this verse? He's worse than an unbeliever. But look at this word provide and use, use these definitions of this Greek word. Is it the responsibility of the husband just to provide? Will he be able to put bread on the table, as we say, or, or clothes on the backs of his children? Will he be able to provide those things if there's no forethought? Doesn't there have to be some kind of planning? Doesn't there have to be, you know, at some point, we're going to need to eat on Friday. Maybe I ought to figure something out, you know, now to make sure that we have, we don't think that way, but don't we? I mean, are you planning to eat next week? At some point, you're going to have to go to the grocery store, right? You know, at some point, you're going to have to decide, you know, what you're going to eat and what it's going to take to eat it, and there's some forethought before it's ever provided. That's what God does. The providence of God is not just God giving me what I need. It's God knowing and not just knowing. And here's what we're going to look at in the coming weeks. It's not just God knowing that I need it. It's God caring that I need it. Is there a difference there? He provides a way for you to get what you need if, if you're serving Him faithfully. What, what's the difference between God... What, well, put it in our, in, in our lives. What's the difference in you knowing that somebody needs something and you caring that somebody needs something? Which, which one of those is going to lend you to action? <laughs> well, I, I, I know that, you know, so-and-so down at work, you know, could, could really needs... Mm, but you, you can't stand so-and-so down at work, right? So if you can't stand, I know it, but I can't stand so-and-so down at work, so what am I going to do? Probably nothing. But if I cared that so-and-so down at work needed something, I might do something about it. And it's not simply that God has a knowledge of these things. It is that God cares about our needs and cares about those things that our, that our life demands and that God is willing and ready to step in and provide those things for us. Let, let me see if I can give you a simple definition for providence. Is that simple enough for you? Um, here's what divine providence involves. And I tried to make it as short as I could, but tough luck. All right, here's God's providence. It's God's support, His preservation, His care, His supervision, and His government. All of these things which he exercises over everything that he has created. From the moment he said, let there be light, and through those six days of creation, all the way down to, to eternity. It's God exercising his support, his care, his foresight, exercising his preservation and supervision over all of these things that he might accomplish the purpose for which they were created. Did God have a purpose in creation? Or, or, would, or did he just have a little chemistry set and he was just playing to see what he could get? Did he have a purpose? Sure he did. Did he have a purpose when, when, when he made man? Sure he did. What was his purpose when he made man? Okay, here we, here were a people that he created. Isaiah 43 and verse 7 says, created for his glory. In His image. What was God's desire for, for us long term? Here's created beings. We'll talk about this in a minute. But that He gave free will to so that we would choose to worship Him, serve Him, obey Him, that we might live with Him for all of eternity. If God created us with that purpose in mind, and then He just threw us out there and said, go for it and didn't do anything to help us reach that purpose, what was the purpose? If it was, make man, 
Make him in my image. You know, give him a soul. Breathe into him the breath of life. You know, put, have, a, have a, an intended desire for him to glorify me and worship me and, and serve me and to live with me in heaven. And boy, I hope they do well because, you know, I'm sending them out on their own. Or is God working all over here and working all over here to help them to do that? Does God do that? Is there any support? Does God provide any support for us to get to heaven? Does God care whether we get to heaven? Does God provide any preservation means for us to get to heaven? Is, is, is there anything that God is doing now in your life and my life to help us get to heaven? Or are we trying to do this all on our own? Right? He gave us His Word. He gave us His Word. He gave... He, he gave us his word that, that the psalmist says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a what? Light unto my path. What does that mean? It's going to show me where to go. I don't have to guess. Don't you wish that you had, you know, one of the, you know, uh, don't you wish you had something like this for everything in life? You know, you're driving somewhere and you probably got one of these GPS or what do they call these, these tom-toms or whatever these crazy things are. And, you know, you just punch it in and say, tell me how to get there. You're putting a lot of trust in that little electronic device, aren't you? Here's the word of God. Lamp into my feet, light into my path. He gave us his son. Is that providence? We're, we're going to spend, uh, it, you know, we'll spend part of a week just talking about that, that, that concept of the providence and the, of God in the whole scheme of redemption and bringing about our salvation. But here's God who had a purpose when He created us. And, and what, I, what, I want us, what I want us to leave every class with and leave this quarter with is, is, is I know most of you walked in here with this, with this understanding, with this appreciation for God that He's working in our life. But I hope when we leave every class, we have that even more. You know, because sometimes we, we look at ourselves in the mirror and we think, you know, we're the only ones that are trying to do right. We look in the mirror and we think, I'm trying to do it all on my own. Look, 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 in, uh, look in Joshua chapter 1. Here, here's a guy that may have looked in the mirror and thought he was trying to do all, all on his own. You get to Joshua chapter 1 and who are you reading about? Take a Take a guess. Joshua, good answer. Uh, we could read the whole chapter, but we don't have time. Joshua chapter 1, let's look at verse 5. Mo, where, where is Moses in Joshua chapter 1? Dead. All right, we've got to get our chronology. Here's, he's dead. Uh, Moses was the leader. Now who's the leader? Joshua. Joshua. Would that be like... Um, Major responsibility to take on? Would you like to fill Moses' shoes? He'd been wearing them for 120 years. That'd be, uh, anyway. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. How was God with Moses? What does that mean? You think, as I was with Moses, how was God was? Here was Moses and, and God was just beside him. Is that, is that as much as God was with Moses, he was just in his presence? Or did God do anything for Moses? What did God... What, did, did, did he have a lamp into his feet and a light into his path? All the way. He had a cool staff and he's not talking about people working under him, right? You got this staff, would you like to have one of those? You know... You think of all that God did for Moses, and it's summed up in this word, as I was with Moses. He wasn't just with him, was he? But when God is with you, not only is he present, he is working. You think about God working ahead of time in his forethought. Did God know that Moses would say, but I am not a man, an eloquent man of good speech? Did he know that Moses would say that? Sure he did. Guess who was already on his way there? Aaron. God already had things worked out for Moses. It makes you wonder, what does God already have worked out for me? What does God already see coming down the road of my life 
and he's already got it worked out. And the funny thing is, is that I'm, you know, if, if there's that spot on the road of my life that God has already got it worked out, I could pass right by that spot in the road and never know there was a spot in the road. Never know there was a difficulty. Never know there was anything that was there that God was taking care of because he took care of it before I ever got there and didn't even realize there was something to take care of. That's a pro- is that confusing? That's the providence of God, isn't it? So uh, uh, anyway, last sentence of the verse. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. There I am. I'm not going to leave you. What's the, is, is it redundant? Is it redundant to say, I won't leave you, I won't forsake you? Is that redundant? Doesn't that mean the same thing? I will not fail you or forsake you. What does this mean? <coughs> say it again. It means I, can do it. I can do it. It's not just that I'm not going to leave your presence. It's not just that you're not going to look up and not see me. It is that I'm going to be right there beside you. What verse is it? Is it the next verse or maybe it's in verse 9? Let's read the next verse, verse 6. Be strong and of good courage for this people you shall divide as an inheritance. The land which I swore to their fathers to give them go. It's got to be verse 9. Well, let's read verse 9 and find out. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He said that three times, be strong and courageous. It's all over. Do you, what is that, do you think that means that Joshua needed strength and he needed courage? Let's see. He was about ready to go in and conquer the promised land. And if he did what God said, he would drive out all of the inhabitants. And Deuteronomy chapter 7 says, utterly destroy everything. But with, here, here's a verse, I, I, if you don't know, I want us to know by the end of this quarter. If God be for us, you know the rest of that verse? Who can be against us? I can know everything there is to know about the providence of God and still not understand the providence of God. Do you understand that? I can know everything that the Bible teaches me about the providence of God and still not understand the providence of God. You might think, great, I'm going to come to a whole quarter of a class and then I still won't know the providence. So I can know everything there is to know about the providence of God and still not have a full understanding of what it is. But all I need to know is if God is for me, that's all that matters. I don't need to worry about anything else. Look, look in Hebrews chapter 13. I'm way off topic here, but I'm going to stay there. Go, look in Hebrews 13. It's, it, 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 it's a real uh, parallel with what he was telling Joshua. Uh, it's a real parallel with what Paul said there in Romans chapter 8, of God before us, uh, who can be against us? Where did I tell you to go? Hebrews 13? Good. Look at the end of verse 5. The end of Hebrews 13 and verse 5. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Who said that? God said that. Who did he say that to? Joshua. You might have a marginal, you might have a marginal note that even refers you back to Joshua chapter 1. Or refers you back to Deuteronomy chapter 31, which was still God saying to Joshua, Deuteronomy 31, I think it's verse 6, that says the very same thing. God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But if he said that to Joshua, why is that being being stated in Hebrews chapter 13? I mean, if that was for Joshua, what does that have to do with the Christians that this is being written to? Huh? I heard heard both of you and didn't understand either of you. The next verse. Oh, you want to skip ahead to to the major point. We'll we'll come back to Cain's comment in a minute. Dan, what did you say? That's what, for his people, all of his people, right? It's not just Joshua. He does it for all of his people. So when I have confidence that I can know that God's not going to leave me or forsake me, what does that confidence lead me to do? Cain says, now look at verse 6. What does that confidence lead me to do? Or I can, does it say so that I can say? Am I leaving out a word? If I just say, I, I know that God's not going to leave me, so I can say. Am I leaving any words out there? Confidently, bold, I can have confidence and boldness that says, The Lord is my helper. And when I know that, what do I know? He's with me. He's, he, he will not forsake me. 
Now think about it. If He's with me, it's more than just His presence. He's not just there. He's helping me. And I know if God is there, that He is my helper. And therefore, I'm not going to fear. What can man do to me? It's interesting. Some translations have this as a question. What can man do to me? Some translations just have it as a statement. I will not fear what man can do to me. I think either way works, don't you? I'm not going to fear what man can do to me. Or, I'm not going to fear. What can man do to me? Why? Because if God is for us. Who can be against us? Was that first bell? Second bell? you got to be kidding. I'm like not even close to being done with this. Here, here, let, 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 me, let me get to this slide and then we're going to quit. Here's what we know. God still works today. He created all things. We talked about that. But the providence of God teaches us that it's not that just God created all things, but that God sustains Everything. You're in the book of Hebrews. Go back to chapter 1. And uh, talking about Jesus, uh, talking about His Son who He spoke through uh, in these last days. That's what uh, uh, the verse 2 says. That God has spoken in these last days through His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds. Same thing we saw about Jesus creating all things. Who, being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he, had said by, when, when he had by himself purged our sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Not only does verse 2 say that he made all things, but verse 3 says that he is upholding everything by the word of his power. What does that mean? What, what is the, does New American Standard have upholding? I don't think it does. Upholds? I thought maybe it was a different translation I saw. What does it mean that he upholds? He is upholding all things by the word of his power. He's doing work. He's doing work. Here, and we're, we'll get to it next time. But, but one of the challenges that, that some people make to the providence of God, one of the things that some people believe that denies the providence of God is the theory of deism. You know anything about deism? Deism believes that God created the world. They don't deny it. They believe that God made everything. And then after He made everything, He took one giant big God step backwards and disappeared. So they've got the concept that I look out into this world and I see things and evolution is just, hmm, I'm a fool if I believe evolution. So they've got the point that says, I see things created, I know that these were created by God, and, and I'm without excuse if I, if I believe otherwise. But then they've got the idea, yes, he set it into motion and then he backed away and never had anything to do with the earth or anything in it. Again, what does Hebrews 1 and verse 3 say? He is, he is present tense, upholding all things by the word of his power. Let's go back to Colossians 1. I told you we'd come back to it. It says in Colossians 1 and verse 16, he created all things. Verse 17 says, he is before all things. And in Him all things consist. How many things did He make in verse 16? All things. What does that include? You want to tell me what that is? There's nothing that's not included there, right? So if He made all things, what is He still doing? In Him, everything has form, has life. Everything in Him consists. What does that mean? about what he is doing now. Is he still working? Well, some people say, well, he, he's, he's still you know, helping the earth to spin around and he's still helping the universe to be in existence. He's still helping all of these, you know, these, mat, these material things. Does he have anything to do with the humans that are still on the earth? Fran? It says in here that he's, he's holding all things together. He is holding all things together. Acts chapter 17, verse 28 says that, that in his, is that verse we said before, in him we live and move and we have our very being. Let, let me stop with this point right here. And that is that when we talk about the providence of God, and, and something we'll see this quarter, you can kind of divide this into two categories. Um, go, go to Acts 17 for just a second. You can kind of divide this into two categories. One is what we would call general providence. Um, 
you think about general providence, is, is the providence of God, when, when the Bible says that in Him all things consist, is that just talking about Christians? Is it just talking about people? You know, in Hebrews chapter 1 when it says He's upholding all things by the word of His power, that's, you know, that's talking about everything, including even non-Christians. And where did I tell you to go? Did I tell you Acts 14? Well, try 14. All right, Acts chapter 14. I know, I know that everything's getting us. Verse 17, we're going to leave with this. That he gives, he gives us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons. Is that just for Christians, the us there? So there is a sense in which there is a general providence of God in that he is providing. Does he provide breath for non-Christians? Or is it, is it just us that have oxygen to breathe? I mean, is it just rain that comes for us? There is a general providence for all people, but then there is a special providence for just a select group, and that's his children. And that's why prayer has the power that it does. It's because when I pray, I don't say, I, I do say, God creator of this universe, but when I say that, I am saying, my Father, which art in heaven, and only a Christian can say that. And God has promised Christians that there is a special providence that is available for them. That He does special things for those who are... Is that true? Am I making that up? Have you seen that in the Bible? You see that in the Old Testament? You see it in the New Testament? Do you see it in your life? There's a, there's a lot we did not get to tonight in, in, in an introductory way. But I, 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 hope that we will, uh, I hope that we will read our Bibles, that we will examine our lives, and I hope we will look for God working in our lives. Providence is not something, and we'll say this several times this quarter, providence is not something you can put your finger on and say, that was the providence of God right there. We don't know. But we do need to recognize God is working today in my life. And to say otherwise, why would I say otherwise? He's my God. He's my Father. He's my Savior. He wants me to go to heaven and go back to that description. He's going to work everything out because that's why He created me. Why would He create me and just leave me? All right, we're going to break for just a minute and allow some to come in.